Lecture five, what does scripture teach us about the sun? So in the progress of our discussion so far, we gave two lectures at the beginning to the doctrine of sin. We talked then for two lectures about the doctrine of the father and related, inseparable from that discussion, the relationship of father and son, which leads us naturally into our discussion now. We move for the next six lectures into discussing the son or Jesus Christ. And we'll give three lectures to talking about the person of Christ, three lectures to talking about the work or the ministry of Christ. But today, just setting a foundation, what does scripture tell us? about who he is. What does it tell us we ought to know and is necessary for us, for us to understand about the Son, about Jesus Christ? I wanna start with just letting you know the objectives for this entire section. For all six of these lectures, I, I have a basic aim and things that I want you to know, and things that I think would be necessary for you to have a solid understanding of the doctrine of Christ. First of all, I want you to know and be able to explain Jesus' person, that he's fully God, fully man, in one person. We'll talk about that primarily in our next lecture. We'll support each one of those points, and then integrating those points becomes complicated. So to do that, you need to be able to effectively demonstrate the deity of Christ. That's one of these three points. And then you have to recognize some Christological heresies, some ways that people have taken these ideas and gone awry or twisted them up. And putting all of that together, then, will conclude with the theological purpose for each of the major events in Jesus' life, talking from his birth, his baptism, his temptation, transfiguration, resurrection, and eventually ascension and enthronement. If you understand these four points and you're able to work with them, you're able to reasonably work your way through what it means on each one of these, I think you've got the foundations for the doctrine of Christ. And as I said, I'll start off today just setting a foundation for what scripture tells us, the kind of core basis across scripture about who he is. So I have a question for you, and that is, if you were to sit down and write out, I'll just give a number, we'll say 20 passages, 20 key passages that describe Jesus Christ, who he is, and why it's important to understand him, what would you say? In fact, I'm going to challenge you to take a moment here. I, I'd like you to do that. I, I'd like you to consider taking the time right now and just for a couple of minutes, go through and try to write out 20 passages. Okay, I'll give you started. Genesis 3.15, the promise of the seed that will be born to the woman that will crush the head of the serpent and bring hope to the human race. Well, that's the very first promise that ties into the hope of the gospel and specifically Jesus Christ as that hope, as the victor. Okay, that could be your first passage. Give me 19 more. If you were going to work through, what would you say? Okay, I would encourage you to pause the video, take a moment, and look for those passages. Write down 20 specific passages pointing to Jesus Christ that are core passages everyone should know. Now, I've done this a couple of times together with classes, and in different cases we've written things up on the board, and I've come up with different lists. Um, I did this myself when I read through the Old Testament once. I went through and highlighted or marked every passage that stood out as an important Christological or Messianic passage. And I ended up with something like 73 passages, about 130 verses. That is definitely very compressed. You could do a lot more than that. I went for the sake of my own exercise and just thinking through this assignment, I went through the process of doing it for myself and I wrote down 20, just 20. I limited myself to that. It was painful. I had to delete some passages out. But if I was going to make an attempt, these are the passages I came up with. And in some cases, I'm stretching it a little bit. I might include several chapters. I would encourage you, if you look across this list of passages and you don't recognize some of them, or you don't know why that passage would be significant and important as describing the doctrine of Christ, why don't you take the time to go back and look at that passage and understand what it tells us about him and why that's important for the development of our own theology about him. 
The process of understanding scripture and its doctrine can be nothing less, absolutely. Nothing inferior to going through and understanding the passages carefully. And I think it would be a very helpful foundation for you for our study during this particular lecture, these, this set of lectures, for you to take the time to understand well what each one of those passages describe, and then to develop a list of your own and come to an understanding of those passages. I am going to set for you a, a group of data points. I'll just mention five here, arguing that Jesus Christ and the story of who he is interweaves the entire story of scripture. Now, here's my concern with this. I have from time to time come across an idea, someone maybe has a neat grid and they'll say something like, okay, the Old Testament, that's focused on the Father. The Gospels, maybe into Acts a little bit, that's focused on, on the Son, Jesus. And then moving from Acts, Pentecost, and definitely the Epistles out through Revelation and into the present, this is the era of the Holy Spirit. So we kind of carve history up into eras, the era of the Father, the era of the Son, the era of the Holy Spirit. And the assumption would go that in the Old Testament, that's primarily focused on just God, not specifying, or the Father, that Jesus Christ arrives, or the Son arrives at the beginning of the New Testament. Okay, it's true that the New Testament explains to us who is Jesus, introducing him to us in a far clearer way than has ever been said before. But it's critical for you to know that Jesus does not just occupy the New Testament, but that the story of who he is is all across scripture, and yes, from the beginning of time itself. So I'll start with a couple of passages that illustrate pre-existence. By pre-existence, what I mean is that from eternity past, Jesus Christ already existed. Jesus Christ already was at work from the beginning of all time. And John 1 is going to show us that kind of pattern. So in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. Now, the striking thing about this is that we're seeing here in the beginning language in a way that echoes for us Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that Genesis kind of framework to say, before there was anything, Jesus Christ was already at work. In fact, in order to support or defend that assertion, notice what comes next in verse 3. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. It's very evident that we don't only have the in the beginning language to call us to Genesis 1, but also the creation concept. Jesus Christ is responsible for creating all things, as we will see also in a future lecture. Similarly, John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. And by placing himself before Abraham, that is the ancestor of all of the Jewish people. Jesus is saying, I existed before one of my earliest ancestors, before him, before he was even in the world, I was. And that language of I am goes even further because it really is calling up a title that we see across Isaiah 40 to 50 as a reference to God, the Father. John 17, 5. Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, which with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus existed before there was a world. Revelation 22, 13, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Another very significant statement that we'll come back to later, but just to recognize here, from the beginning of time to the end of time, Jesus exists. Now, I just mentioned a bit ago, Jesus as creator, and we saw that in John 1, 1 to 3. It's not only there, however, we see that language here, but Colossians 1 is going to go on. For by him were all things created, things that are in heaven, things that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Here it is again. All things were created by him and for him. Before there was a world, before there was anything that was made, there was Jesus. Jesus existed before it all. 
And you can just walk now through the rest of history. So coming forward from the creation, you'll discover that Jesus is the one that led the people out of the wilderness. Jude 5, I will put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not. And by the Lord, it's referring to Jesus Christ, this our Lord Jesus Christ. Who is the one that brought the people out of the land? Jesus brought them out of the land. Jesus is the one who brought about the Exodus, and certainly together with the Father. You also see a really interesting passage uh, or pattern around the captain of the Lord of hosts. So Joshua is by Jericho. He's prepared. He's going to enter in. And he sees a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. Remember that language, sword in his hand. Joshua went unto him and said, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. Now, that's interesting. Because as captain of the Lord's host would, I would argue, distinguish him from the Lord himself. Here's the army of God, and this is the captain of the army of God. But Joshua's response is he fell on his face to the earth and worshipped. And we'll return to this idea or this argument later. That God alone, I mean, very clear across scripture. It's right there in the Ten Commandments. At the front end of the Ten Commandments, God is the only one you must worship. Why is Joshua worshiping this captain of the Lord's host? Why would the captain accept it? And in fact, the captain of the Lord's host said to him, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot. The place where on thou standest is holy. It's holy ground, which, if you recognize, sounds a whole lot like Exodus 3, which is the burning bush incident where God revealed himself to Moses. So who is this captain of the Lord of hosts? It's God, but it's somehow separate too. And if you just watch that pattern, remember I highlighted the language a little bit ago. He's standing over there with his sword drawn in his hand. There are two other passages that kind of echo this. Numbers 22, 31, he sees the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand. The angel of the Lord speaks to him in language that, that again requires that he cannot be anything other than God himself. One other time, you see the angel of the Lord standing between the earth and the heaven. I mean, that itself is striking. This massive figure having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. He has a sword that stretches out over the city. And at each one of these points, what are you seeing? You're seeing an, a manifestation of God. You're seeing a manifestation of a person who at the same time is somehow separate from God. And he's speaking as a great victor, as an authoritative warrior. He's the captain of the Lord of hosts. He reigns. He's in control. But who is this person? How can he both be God and somehow, apparently, separate from God? One other pattern that does this is the pattern of the angel of the Lord. Now, we'll return to this concept in quite a bit more depth in a future lecture. I'm saving it for right now. But if you just go through scripture and you look for the angel of the Lord, you're going to find this quite a bit. It's a major theme across scripture. It's a big deal as a pattern all across the Old Testament. And as I've said already with the captain of the Lord of hosts, you're going to get the impression that this person is both equal to God, but also somehow distinct from God. So whoever this angel of the Lord is, he's got to be both divine and also something distinct from the Father. The Old Testament never explains how this works. It just kind of leaves it there. And you're wondering, looking at this pattern and trying to figure out what's happening, you have to keep on reading your Bible. Because the rest of Scripture now will start to explain some of the fullness of what this means and who he is. Which takes me now to the topic that will occupy the rest of our time. I want to talk about titles of Jesus. And specifically, I'm going to talk about four major titles you must understand in order to know who he is. The titles we'll talk about are Emmanuel, Messiah, Son of Man, and Son of God. Okay, those four titles, very important for you to know. Messiah, Emmanuel, Son of Man, Son of God as descriptions of who Jesus is 
and what it means then to follow him and have a relationship with him. Let's start out with Emmanuel. And the title Emmanuel actually doesn't occur that much across scripture. The basic foundation for the idea is in Isaiah. The Lord will give a sign, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And a bit later, Isaiah 8, he shall pass through Judah, he shall overflow, he shall reach, and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. And if you keep on going in that context in Isaiah 8, you're going to discover not long after, you're going to find the language of God is with us. The language of actually a messianic expectation. Now, that's then setting the foundation for where we next meet the title, and it's Matthew 1. She shall bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus, he will save his people from their sins. And this will fulfill what was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And to make sure you understood the concept, he'll go ahead and interpret it. Because maybe a Greek reader might not know what's happening and what this means, which being interpreted is God with us. You know, that's exactly the word. In fact, if you break the word down, it's that. It's as though you took the words, God with us, take those, those three words and put them together, crash them together, take out the spaces and just make it a single word, God with us. And that's what Emmanuel is in Hebrew. It's just the three words, with us, God himself. See, but now that raises a lot of theological interest or actually awe. Because the entire Old Testament, arguably, is built around this difficult question. How is it possible for anyone to dwell with a holy God? And from the earliest days of Old Testament history, we discover that the people are too sinful, too failing, too rebellious to dwell with a holy God. In fact, that's the basis of the temple. The temple is to show you that God dwells in their midst, yes, in a way, but there have to be limitations. He can't dwell directly with them, otherwise he would consume them. God upon Sinai and the fire and the glory, so fearful that even Moses is afraid. And so there's a boundary set up so that people won't touch the mountain. Or you can recall the incident where they're moving the ark and someone just reaches out to steady the ark so it doesn't fall. And just touching it, they're killed because of the glory of God striking out against them. See, how do you possibly dwell with a holy God who is that holy if you are as wicked as we are? And the answer comes then with this concept of God dwelling with us. But I'd like to pause before I make that connection and just recognize an entire theology that undergirds this and the beauty of this concept. Isaiah 12, 6, cry out and shout, inhabitants of Zion. And these words are rich. Great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. Okay, but here's the marvel of it. He's great. He's holy. And yet, though he's great and holy, he is also in your midst and associated with Israel. The great one, the holy one, in your midst, oh Israel, and the two ideas almost wouldn't fit together. In fact, in terms of the Old Testament, there isn't yet an explanation for how it's even possible. How can a holy, great, omnipotent, pure God who is of purer eyes than to behold evil how can he dwell with sinful people? Well, that would take a miracle. That would take something like Emmanuel. Ezekiel 48, 35, describing here the temple. And then it concludes this out. And the name of the city from that day shall be, the Lord is there. The Lord is in your midst. But how? John 1, 14, the word was made flesh. He dwelt among us. I mean, the language of God with us, Emmanuel, is fulfilled right here. He dwells among us, and we beheld his glory. In fact, the book of Matthew concludes with this promise. Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. He is with us, God, in all of his glory. Revelation 21.3 
I heard a great voice out of heaven. The tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And therefore the city does not need a sun, neither the moon to shine in it, because the glory of God is its light. The lamb is the light thereof. So if I'm putting together all of the pieces of this concept, Emmanuel, and I put that into the story of the entire Bible, starting out with the, the overwhelming question of how a holy God can dwell with sinful people, the answer comes like this, oh, but he will. The word, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel himself will dwell in our midst. And because Emmanuel himself dwells in our midst, he will make it possible not just that temporarily, not just that for 30 years during the time of his life, God would dwell in our midst, but in the future and for all eternity because of what Jesus Christ has done through the sacrifice of his cross. He will make it possible that forever God will dwell in our midst. But before I leave this title, just ponder again what it's saying. Who is Jesus? He's Emmanuel. He is God in our midst. And the two poles of that, like what we saw with great in your, in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. The two poles of it, he is fully and completely in every way truly God. When you see Jesus Christ, you see God. And he is also in our midst. He doesn't turn away from us. Though we're sinful, though we're broken, though we're failing, Jesus Christ chooses to live among us. The word made flesh dwelling in our midst so that we can have relationship with God. This is Emmanuel. Second title is the title of Messiah. And here it helps us to recognize that we're looking at actually two different words in two different languages. So the word Messiah appears in the Old Testament usually translated anointed or anointed one. And as we move across from Messiah Old Testament into the New Testament, then the word Messiah is just finding its equivalent in the word Christ. Okay, just so to clarify then, so that we understand what's happening here. So a number of years ago, I arrived for the first time in the Philippines. And as I was sitting in church and hearing people preaching and praying and that kind of thing, I kept on hearing this word, Paginoan, Paginoan, Paginoan. And what is that? I had no idea. I mean, at, at that point, I don't know if that's the word the. I don't know if that's a verb is. I, I have no idea what the word is. I just keep on hearing it. And eventually I get around and I ask somebody what it means and they answer me, it's just the word Lord. So, okay, well, that makes sense. Why am I hearing it a lot in preaching and prayers and everything? They're calling out to the Lord or speaking of the Lord. Okay, it's a quite natural thing. And so I give that as an example to just say, here's a language with two different, or two different languages, but it's the same word. I mean, pretty much roughly the words map basically the same. And so they're referring to the same thing. It's just with two different languages. Well, here's what's going on. You have the word Mashiach, which is translated, that's Hebrew, that's translated anointed one. And on the other side, you have the Greek word Christos, which is translated Christ. And I put that up there for you to recognize that when we're talking about anointed one or Messiah, Mashiach, and when we're talking about Christos or Christ, what we're talking about is just a translation. You just move from the Old Testament way of saying it to the New Testament way of saying it, the Hebrew way of saying it, one language, to the Greek way of saying it, a different language. But we're talking about really fundamentally the same word. And that's very important to understand because once you grasp that, you realize what's happening here. The Old Testament has predicted the coming of an anointed one, a Messiah, one who will save his people from their sins. And that anointed one, when he comes, is identified now as the Christ. Let me show you what that looks like initially in the Old Testament and a number of passages that do this. So you have these statements like 1 Samuel 2.10. 
The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth. He shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his Messiah, the victor, the Messiah. It's 1 Samuel 2.35. I will raise up a faithful priest. He will do according to all that I desire, what is in my heart and in my mind. I will build him a sure house. He shall walk before my anointed, my Messiah, forever. Here, 2 Samuel 22.51. God is the tower of salvation for his king. He shows mercy to his anointed unto David and to his seed forevermore. There's some ambiguity here because David is an anointed king. But there's more. It's the seed of David, the descendant of David, that seems to be in view. Psalm 2 is very explicit. We've looked at this passage before. The kings of the earth set themselves. The ruler take counsel, rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And you're kind of scratching your head now. Who is this anointed one, this Messiah one, that's parallel somehow with God? Psalm 1850 is quoting the passage we saw earlier, the anointed to David and to his seed. Psalm 132, another Davidic passage, I will make the horn of David to bud. I have ordained a lamp for my anointed one. And most astonishing, Daniel 9, God will tell you the timing from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the prince. Who is that? And a little bit later, after 62 weeks, you discover that the Messiah, the Prince, this is actually at the end of the total 69, the Messiah will be cut off. And we could translate this, have nothing. So now we're discovering, according to Psalm 2, that this anointed one who has the special blessing of God, who's parallel to God himself, Psalm 2, is going to be cut off, Daniel 9, and, and die? See, you've got some things going on in the Old Testament that just raise a lot of questions, but everyone recognized that this anointed language had to point to something more than just David and more than just an earthly king. But the people of Jesus' time were waiting for that Messiah, that anointed one, who would finally bring hope for the nation not just the nation, but for the world. One more comment before I finish this out. It's been observed that anointing, pouring oil, recognizing an office of someone who has a responsibility before God as kind of designated as a leader, that was mostly given, basically given to three offices, either prophets, priests, or kings. And you see across the story of the Old Testament that God is working to provide Israel with a righteous king, except the kings keep on failing. And they need a priest, but the priests keep on dying. And they need a prophet, but the prophets fail because they can't really change people's hearts. And part of the story of the Old Testament is that you're waiting for a king that will rule righteously, a prophet that can actually change the way people think, and a priest that can deal with their sins forever not just keep on offering sacrifices. And the link is very strong between those offices, prophet, priest, and king, and this concept of the anointed one. Now watch what happens then when you come to the New Testament. And the New Testament begins right at the front door with this introduction. It's the book of the generation of Jesus, and I would prefer to translate this, Jesus the Christ, or Jesus the Messiah. Matthew 1.16, Jesus, or excuse me, the genealogy of Jesus, Joseph the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. He's called the Messiah. And if you keep on going, you see this pattern now becoming repeated. The birth of Jesus Christ. Where will the Christ be born? The works of Christ. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And just continuing through the New Testament, it becomes massive and overwhelming. 530 times across the New Testament, you're going to see this title, Christ. These are all just the references in the New Testament that use this title. And a couple of passages that I think will highlight for you that this is not just a name, but it's actually a title. I'll show you those passages in a moment. Let me make sure you understand what I'm saying. Sometimes we hear the reference to Christ, 
And we're thinking of this as though you know, Jesus Christ, it's like a last name or something. So you can talk about a person's first name, Juan, and their last name, De La Cruz. And so Juan De La Cruz, it's like there's the last name and we're seeing something like that, Jesus Christ. No, that's not what's going on at all. And you need to know this in order to understand the New Testament well. You've if you think that, you've got to correct that thinking and don't forget, <laughs> you've got to remember this. Let me show you passages that illustrate it. So watch the language of not just Christ, but the Christ. Watch from Babylon to the Christ. Okay, I would be perfectly justified in translating to the Messiah. Or in Matthew 2, Herod wants to know, where the Christ, where the Messiah will be born. When Peter affirms to Jesus that he is truly the Messiah, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Do not be called instructors. instructors. You have one instructor, and it is the Messiah. The charge at Jesus' trial, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And we can just keep on going in multiple other places. John 141, we have found, this is very explicit, the Messiah, which means Christ. What you've done here, in this case, they've actually included the transliteration of the Hebrew word, and then they've translated it so that they're making sure you see the link. John makes sure that you see Messiah, Christ, same word. It's Hebrew, it's Greek, same word. We know that the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. This is the Christ, the Christ coming from Galilee. And I have to stop. There are so many other passages I'd love to show you, but the richness of this pattern now, as you go through the rest of the New Testament, every time you, re you read Jesus Christ, don't just read over that. What are they saying? Every time the New Testament says Jesus Christ or Jesus the Christ, it's an assertion. And the assertion is this. Remember what the Old Testament prophesied? Remember the hope and the longing of people for centuries? When will the Messiah come? Remember that. And remember the hope of the Old Testament for a perfect prophet, a perfect priest, a perfect king. The kings keep on sinning, the prophets fail, the priests die. How will we ever have a solution to the problem of our sin? Here he is. He fulfills all of that because he is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is everything that the Old Testament longed for and hoped for. He has come. Jesus, the Christ. The title that he carries is that he fulfills the hopes and the longings of the ages. Two more titles. And the first title is Son of Man. The second title we'll talk a, a bit later is the Son of God. But I want to explain one thing first. And here is something I'll just refer to as the Son of Phenomenon. The phenomenon here is something you and I might not initially be familiar with. And it's a Hebrew idiom. Okay, if you wanted to say that someone was like something, this is a way you could do it. Son of something would communicate something about their nature or their attributes. And so if you wanted to communicate various things about them, then this is how you do it. Son of, and then say what you want to say. Here are some examples. So for instance, Joseph is calling, called a son of fruit bearing. That sounds very odd. And so our translations will say something like a very fruitful branch. In 1 Chronicles, sons of priests, sons of singers, or sons of prophets, it doesn't mean that they're preacher's kids or that they're children of choir members. It's that they are themselves priests and prophets. It's a way of saying that you're a priest, a son of a priest, meaning you are a priest. Even animals, if you're talking about sons of goats, it can simply mean that this is a kind of goat. Some of these expressions don't even sound right to us in English. So son of a threshing floor or a son of fatness, what that refers to is kind of the results of threshed corn or a fruitful place. Even using this, this language to describe age, a son of 30 years is a 30 year old or to describe someone's fate so that a son of death means the person's going to die or a son of beating means the person will be beaten. You even pick this up in the New Testament when you get sons of wrath. 
And what that's referring to is that we deserve wrath because of our sin. Okay, so the son of language means that you are that thing. A son of wisdom, you are a wise person. A son of folly, you are a foolish person. A son of wealth, you are a rich person. A son of poverty, you are a poor person. That's the pattern. And that becomes very interesting now when we talk about Jesus Christ as the son of man and the son of God. What would it mean that Jesus is the son of man, based on what I just said and what I just explained. Son of man, that you can see, would simply mean he is a human. In fact, this pattern is not just limited to him. So I'm going to show you here the book of Ezekiel, and I'm just searching for the word or the language son of man in Ezekiel, and it happens 93 times, referring it's very simple, just to Ezekiel. It's not referring to the Messiah or to Jesus or anything like that. So what is God doing here? All he's saying to Ezekiel over and over is, human, human, I have something to say to you. Human, go and speak a word for me. Human, go declare to them. He's just calling Ezekiel a human. Why then would this become Jesus' favorite title? Because as you walk through the Gospels, and I think you would be familiar with this just from hearing it, it's constant. Another 84 times in the Gospels, you're going to read Son of Man, Son of Man, Son of Man. This is Jesus' favorite title for himself. At very sometimes strategic places, he comes to the disciples and he asks them saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? I mean, that's the title he chooses for himself. He constantly refers to himself as the Son of Man. What does that mean? Is Jesus just highlighting, I'm a human, I'm a human, I'm a human? And the answer is, well, okay. I mean, that could be part of the idea. As we're going to see in a future discussion, Jesus is fully God, but he's also fully human. And so it would be legitimate enough to say something like, okay, well, I see that Son of God talks about his deity, and Son of Man talks about his humanity, and those two put together, oh, wow, fully God, fully man, Son of God, Son of Man. None of that would be exactly illegitimate, but it would be incomplete. Because there is an important passage that defines the concept of Son of Man. There's a very important foundation set in Daniel 7. In Daniel 7, we meet one like the Son of Man. He comes with the cloud of heaven, clouds of heaven. He comes to the Ancient of Days. They bring him near before him, and he receives dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him forever. Okay, now the critical language here is that it's one like the Son of Man. Who is this Son of Man? And what makes him so significant? And how is he coming up before the Ancient of Days? And why does he have all glory and a kingdom so that all nations would serve him? I mean, who deserves to be served and honored by all nations forever except for God himself? But see, it's so ambiguous, or so, so, uh, such a puzzle such a mystery, so mysterious, to have one like a son of man, a human, come before the Ancient of Days. And what you discover about this pattern now is that Jesus, when he refers to himself as son of man, he doesn't only refer to himself as a son of man. See, if, if Jesus' point was, well, I'm a human, and so just recognize I'm just a mere human, then you could see that concept. Okay, Jesus is identifying himself as a human. No, because Jesus is identifying himself not as a son of man, but the son of man. And there are two points to that. The first is that Jesus is identifying himself as the son of man described in Daniel 7. That son of man, not just to say I am a human, but I am the human, the human that we met in Daniel 7, the human that people are expecting and awaiting, the human that will transform the world itself, the human of all time, the human who will receive kingdoms and dominion and glory so that all peoples and nations and languages would serve him forever. 
that human, the human, the human of Daniel 7. And the other concept, I think, is that Jesus is not only just referring to him, uh, him, himself as one among the many humans, but that Jesus is recognizing himself as the climactic human, the climactic human of all time. Adam sinned, Adam failed, and the result of Adam's sin now is the mess we see about us in this broken world of ours. Jesus Christ, the second Adam, comes and he brings life and hope. So that Jesus Christ, the second Adam, the ultimate climactic human, the Son of Man, will change the world when he reigns over all things. There's one more climax in this pattern of the Son of Man, and it occurs, fittingly, at Jesus' trial. So the high priest is trying to pin down what exactly he can say in order to condemn Jesus. And the high priest demands of him, I adjure thee by the living God, Tell us whether thou be the Messiah, the Son of God. And you can see here that the high priest has gone to these core labels, this core language, and bundled them together. These things are related, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus answered, thou hast said. And this would be an expression of agreement. What you have said is right. But I say to you, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. Now the high priest's response is obvious. The high priest hears that as blasphemy. So whatever this means, Jesus apparently made a very bold claim. And in fact, when we understand it better, yes, he did. Jesus right here, if you remember the language, he just cited Daniel 7. And now the kind of mystery, if you would want to call it that, of Jesus referring to himself as son of man all the way through the Gospels. Why does he refer to himself all the way through? Now all of that becomes absolutely clear. He is not just a son of man, a mere human, but he's the son of man. He's that son of man. He's coming on the clouds of heaven. He is divine. He has authority over all things in heaven and on earth. He reigns forever. Jesus is that son of man. What does it mean then that Jesus Christ is the son of man? Does it affirm his humanity? Yes, with limits. It refers, his human, refers to his humanity that Jesus is fully human and no reservations there. Jesus is human in every sense that I am human. See, but there's something bigger also going on. And that is that Jesus Christ is not just a human, but he is the human. He's the human of Daniel 7 who reigns over all things. And he is the climactic, paradigmatic, perfect human of all time who will fulfill everything that humanity ought to be. That takes me to the final title we'll discuss in this lecture, and that's the title of the Son of God. Now, for my discussion here, I'm gonna use a graphic, and that graphic, I think, will help us keep track of the progression of ideas, because in order to really understand this concept, you have to walk across from the Old Testament to see its development into the New Testament, but I think in the process, we're going to discover great richness in how all of these ideas fit together. Just before we go there, a reminder again, son of, and that formula as a way of describing someone. So a son of 30 years, he's 30 years old, a son of wrath, a person who's going to receive wrath, or even an angry person, a son of violence, a violent person, son of man, at the fundamental level, a person, a human, and here, son of God, what would that affirm? If Jesus Christ is Son of God, well, he's just claimed to be nothing other than God himself. Now, let me explain those ideas out more fully using a couple of, a couple of, a pattern across scripture. I'll start with an overview of the graphic, and let's recognize the Old Testament side of it up above in three forms or three patterns. Israel is my son, the Davidic son, the Messianic son. That coming to its central core, Jesus Christ as the unique son of God. And then I'm explaining that down below, the New Testament fullness of this, with three concepts we discover in reference to Jesus Christ as the unique son of God. Now, let's work 
through each one of these in turn, and let's understand the richness of them. Starting out, we do definitely find a pattern across the Old Testament with Israel as the son or Israel as the one who is blessed with this title. A couple of passages that do this, you will say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn son. In Deuteronomy 14, you are the children of the Lord your God. Or Hosea 11, when Israel was a child, I loved him, I called my son out of Egypt. Okay, now these patterns are significant, striking enough, and repeated enough that Jews of the time would identify themselves this way. We talked about some of this language last time, the concept that God is Father, then as we followed the development across the Old Testament, initially God is Father, Israel as Son, and those are linked. But you find pretty quickly as you move across the Old Testament that something richer is going on, and it's connected now to the Davidic Son. Watch this language, specifically pointing to David and the promises made to him. This is talking about David and his descendant. And the descendant of David, I will be his father, he shall be my son. I will not take my mercy away from him. I will settle him in thine ho my house and in my kingdom forever. His throne shall be established forevermore. Psalm 89, he shall cry unto me, thou art my father, my God, the rock of my salvation. I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. And part of the complexity of these passages, you start to realize that these promises that are made to David, and they are authentically and genuinely made to David, there's something else going on. It, it, somehow you can tell that it's pointing further than just David, because it's connected to David's offspring, David's descendant. And that starts to take us to then the third pattern in the Old Testament, the pattern of the Messianic son. Several passages that do this, and one of which we've already looked at before. I'll start with a second, Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage? Why do they take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed? Remember that language, the Messiah. Well, we discover the Lord has said, thou art my son to this Messiah. This day have I begotten thee. And this son, whoever he is, distinct somehow from the father, will break them with a rod of iron, dash them in pieces. He will rule over the uttermost parts of the earth. And so the counsel goes, be wise, O kings, be instructed, serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling, kiss the son. And all throughout, the pattern you're getting is some kind of distinction, the Lord and the Son, or up above, the Lord and his Messiah. You're seeing a distinction, but you're also seeing parallel, to serve the Lord, to kiss the Son, to acknowledge that God is God, to acknowledge that the Son is King. This must go together. And then the charge is to obey the Lord by obeying his Son. See, when I get done with the Old Testament, I've seen in the early parts, okay, Israel, see, okay, I can understand maybe God's expressing some kind of love for the nation, and maybe even for David, okay. And by the time I get to the end, this can't just be David, and this can't just be Israel. And now the title, son, has progressed from Israel to David to more richly or most richly, some future coming person who will be not just a son, but the son. And that takes us to the pattern that we have in the New Testament, Jesus Christ, the unique son of God. You remember what we did with son of man. So, I mean, properly speaking, I can call myself a son of man. And you can call yourself a son of man. We're all humans. See, the difference is that Jesus called himself the son of man. You find the similar thing here. I can call myself a child of God, so can you. See, but Jesus didn't just call himself a child of God, but he called himself the Son of God. Several passages that do that. Matthew 3, 17, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son. That's a fulfillment of Psalm 2, so linking those passages together. This is the one in whom I am well pleased. God has never been fully well pleased with any other person on their own merits. But this one, he's pleased with this one. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. 
He's the only one like that who carries that, carries that title, Jesus alone. Again, at the transfiguration, the cloud saying, or the voice saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Or at the trial, again, the high priest saying, I adjure thee to tell thee whether, us whether thou art the Messiah, the son of God. And at the conclusion, after Jesus' crucifixion, the centurion looks and sees it all, and he has to confess, truly, this one was the Son of God. What are we looking at then with this title? The pattern is that Jesus Christ is uniquely related to God as God's Son. And that includes three components, just to talk quickly through the full development of what it means to be Son of God. Number one, the Son is equal with the Father. John 5, 18, the Jews sought to kill them because he said that God was his Father making himself equal with God. To be the Son of God is to maintain equality with God. John 5, 23, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. If you do not honor the Son, you do not honor the Father. Why? Because they're equal. Or that you would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, that believing you have life through his name. Why? Because to believe in him is to believe in the one that God has sent and the life that he gives. At the same time, even while it shows that the Son is equal with the Father, it shows that the Son is also distinct from the Father. And a number of passages that do this. All things are delivered unto me by my Father. No man knows the Son except the Father, neither any man knows the Father except the Son. Okay, so they're equal, and they are each fully God, but they are also distinct because they relate to each other. John 3.35, the Father loves the Son. John 5.26, the Father gives life to the Son. And we talked about that in the previous lecture to say that during Jesus' time on earth, while he was incarnate, the Father gave life. The Father has sanctified and sent the Son into the world. And in all of these points, then, we're seeing not just that the Son is equal with the Father, but that he's also separate from the Father. Now, just to clarify, or for us to get what we mean by this, you realize what that's saying. This is the foundational doctrine that will return to the doctrine of the Trinity. We've talked about this over and over, that the foundation of the Trinity goes that there are three persons each one is fully God. The three persons are distinct, and ultimately there is one God. Well, in this respect, here we are. Jesus Christ is distinct from the Father, and yet he is also fully God. There's one final pattern, and the pattern here with the language of Son is to show that the Son willingly submits to the Father. John 5, 26, as the Father has life, he has given the Son to have life. When you have lifted up the Son, then you will know that I am He, that I do nothing of myself or by myself, but as the Father taught me, I speak. Jesus Christ speaks as an extension of the Father's will. John 12, 49, I have not spoken of myself or independently all by myself, but I speak together with what the Father has given me to speak. John 14, do you believe not that I am in the Father and the Father in me, that it is in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. And we talked about passages like this in our previous discussion, recognizing that we could read these and, and come to the wrong conclusion that somehow Jesus is inferior to the Father. What are we looking at in passages like these? Very simple. We're looking simply at the pattern that Jesus Christ does not act independently. He does not act separately of the Father, from the Father, but together with the Father, he fulfills the Father's will. And to summarize everything we've said then about the Son of God, the Son of Man, Messiah and Emmanuel, put all the pieces together. Emmanuel, who dwells with us? God himself dwells with us in the person of his son. That tells us that Jesus Christ himself is none other than God. And how does he come or how does he fulfill God's intentions? Well, he comes as Messiah, fulfilling all of the hopes of the Old Testament. He comes as son of man, meaning fully human, as human as I am, we'll see in our next lecture. And yet at the same time, more than that, because he's not just a son of man, 
but he is the Son of Man, the Son of Man from Daniel 7 that rules over all kingdoms, tongues, and peoples forever. And finally, because he is Son of God, he is no less than God. Jesus Christ is equal with the Father, even while he is distinct from the Father, a separate person, as we'll talk about in our next lecture, but fully God and fully equal with Almighty God. Now, the richness of these themes and of these patterns stretches across the entire New Testament. It's all throughout the Gospels, and then the epistles continue to explain and interpret what all of it means. And it's so much information, and it's so rich, it is overwhelming. Here's my encouragement as we conclude this lecture. Just to appreciate the rich wisdom and beauty of how God brought all of these themes, titles, and truths together in our Bibles, and the beauty of what that means for you. Your Savior was predicted across the Old Testament and longed for by generations, Messiah. And he comes as taking flesh, as human as you are, son of man, but not just another human. To say that he can't do anything because he is just limited by his humanity. But he comes also fully human and fully God so that he can save you from your sins. And the result of that is that now you can dwell with God, Emmanuel, because God dwells with us. In these titles and in the rich beauty of their truths, you and I found, find our salvation and our hope. The Messiah has come. Salvation is here. Life is made available to all who believe on him. And as we continue in our next lecture, we'll come to understand some of the richness of how these truths relate to one another and how it's possible that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Emmanuel, Son of Man, Son of God, provided life for all of the world.